Welcome everybody to the um, <clears throat> quantum physics computing and enterprise webinar. Um, we're going to start with an introduction by the director of the Science Foundation Ireland, Dr. Mark Ferguson. So welcome everyone. It's my great pleasure just to say a few opening words. Uh, so first of all, Science Foundation Ireland is delighted to support uh, research in uh, quantum, all sorts of quantum, quantum computing, quantum physics, quantum materials, and so on. Really important emerging science. A few new developments. Uh, there have been uh, some recent recruitments in the quantum field. Seamus Davis, who you'll hear from uh, very shortly, um, a joint appointment with the University of Oxford, also a Royal Society professor. Uh, Professor Hess recruited uh, to Trinity College Dublin, uh, and a number of initiatives at EU level, Science Foundation Ireland, has uh, co-funded Quantera, which is a European program in uh, quantum. Um, so we're uh, very positive about this emerging technology, really look forward to the event. It's very important for academia. It's also very, <coughs> very important for industry. Delighted that IBM are, are with us uh, on this call. And so without further ado from me, a very warm welcome. Thanks very much everybody for joining. And I'll hand back over to you, Michael. All right, thank you, Dr. Ferguson. Um, before I introduce the three panelists, I'd like to just thank the um, co-organizers of this. You can see it hopefully on the screen behind me, but number one is the Embassy of Ireland. We call it the Irish Embassy in Washington, DC, and also Science Foundation Ireland in Dublin and globally. And also contributing was the uh, significantly were the consulates, the Irish consulates in Boston and in San Francisco, in particular Aoife Ryan, who was until recently at the consulate, she's now back in Ireland, in Dublin. Uh, they've been working to develop us ireland scientific links and have been highly supportive of our main sponsor is the ireland america science forum so i encourage all of you viewing today to take a look at that i notice i didn't put the website on there just google iasf space ireland otherwise you'll get an indian america science forum um, <clears throat> and uh, please join that and see what activities we have going on we're having webinars of all sorts and different aspects of Ireland, America, links in science. Um, also want to acknowledge the Immigrant Support Program and the importance of a recent grant that Dr. Bob Morrow got for ESP uh, to uh, support the Ireland America Science Forum. And of course, I'm going to acknowledge my university, Boston College, who's given support as well for this. So as I said, we are three panelists to talk about um, quantum, both from the fundamental physics where everything begins, to applications and uh, the future current, which aren't very many. We're going to hear about what's under development. And, and of course, the bright future is perceived by scientists and engineers and technologists worldwide. Uh, I'll introduce the three panelists in a moment, but just a few comments about um, the migration that's happening now from so-called classical computers. We refer to them as classical because what's not quantum in physics is classical. If there's no H bar, then it's classical. Um, so everything we know about electricity and electronics is classical in, the, in respect right now. Um, but it has led to the technology we're working on now, our mobile phones, our computers, lasers, GPS, all kinds of things, self-driving cars that's going on. It's all as a result of computational power and those are all among a subset of things that stand to be advanced significantly once we move to turbocharged computational power that is promised by quantum computation. I think it's worth noting that all of the, the beginnings of computing in the 1940s and 50s and 60s on up through now, and all of the main inventions associated with classical physics in that sense in computing started with curiosity driven basic research. So it's, it's appropriate that we have uh, fundamental curiosity driven scientists here with cognizant of applications. And then we have as panelists, the funding agency and government support representation and also major corporate uh, utilization and drivers of computation and in, in including future quantum computation. So it all starts with materials and phenomena, and we're gonna hear some about all of that, but then there's a whole new realm of hardware that needs to be supported by a new realm of software. 
in quantum computation and all the applications. And I forget where it was I found in a, in a, in a webinar or a, a talk given somewhere recently, but uh, an interesting thing about quantum computing versus classical computing is that uncertainty is a feature rather than a bug. That's an interesting thing to keep going. Okay, so now our three panelists. Um, first one I'll introduce is J.C. Seamus Davis. He is the professor of quantum physics at University College Cork and professor of physics at Oxford University. Seamus got his bachelor's in Cork and his PhD at UC Berkeley. Uh, he was then professor at Berkeley for a number of years and rising from assistant to full professor. And then he moved to Cornell University uh, and at around 2003 and five years later was named the J.G. White Distinguished Professor. Simultaneous to parts of that, he was a senior physicist at Brookhaven National Lab and ran a Department of Energy program there. And also a distinguished professor at St. Andrews University in Scotland. Just last year, he moved home to Cork. He's a Cork native from Skibbereen, and he's now, as I mentioned, at UC Cork and, and also at Oxford. Uh, there's too many accolades to mention, so Seamus, I won't say them all, but he's an APS fellow. He's the National Academy of Science member at the United States and many, many other. Um, next, we have Dr. Rui Zhou. Ni hao, Dr. Zhou. Dr. Zhou is director of IBM Research in Ireland. She got a PhD in material science at Rutgers University. She did a postdoc at Los Alamos National Lab and uh, in conversations with her, we have many mutual friends there. Um, she has more than 30 publications and numerous patents and more than two decades of support of, uh, at IBM research. At, at IBM Ireland, she drives innovation in artificial intelligence, healthcare, cloud computing, and all aspects of the emergence of quantum computing. Finally, we have Dr. Kiran Shoga, Deputy Director of Deputy Director General of Science Foundation Ireland. Uh, Kiran got his bachelor's and PhD in, in a PhD in quantum physics at Trinity College Dublin. He has two decades, he had two decades of effort at Accenture in both Ireland and South Africa. And while at SFI now, he's in charge of organizational strategy, corporate communications, and international efforts. So with that, I'd like to go over to um, <clears throat> Dr. Davis for some introductory remarks and we'll cycle through each of the three uh, just to introduce introduce remarks. Basically, what is your role? What is your background that led you to the current role and efforts in computation or in quantum materials? And how do you see briefly your efforts merging towards part of creating part of the future? And then we'll come back with sort of group questions for everybody. So first, uh, Seamus, please. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen now if that's, uh, if that's good. Maggie, can you control that? There we go. All right. All right, can you see um, my screen now? It says quantum Oops. matter, quantum technology. Oh, we technology. see you. Okay. And, uh, yeah, so the host has disabled uh, attendee screen sharing. Give us a minute, everybody. Are you working on that, Maggie? Yeah, one second. Sorry, everyone. I just set up all panelists. Hopefully that works. Try again, Seamus, maybe. Okay, hold on. Okay, this looks good. Uh, now, can you see my screen? Now we got it. All right, great. So um, uh, my background is in um, study of quantum matter. And 
luckily for me, this is now becoming a central issue for quantum technology. So in answer to Mike's question, I'm just going to quickly make some comments about that. So, you know, all of us know it has taken roughly 80 years to get from the first, you know, programmable digital computers through these famous devices here to where we are now in 2020. And in terms of mainframe, we has, have extraordinarily powerful classical computers. Here's the IBM Summit. It's about several hundred petaflops. So hundreds of millions of billions of logical operations per second. An extraordinary achievement and an amazing tool for science and for many other applications. But there are many, many, many problems which are just not tractable by a, quantum, by a classical computer. You could not simulate the, bio, the biomolecule here is the spike protein on, on COVID-19. There's no way to simulate its existence from first principles with a classical computer. Similarly, your personal genomics, there's no way to simulate it. Um, search for new quantum materials, impossible. On the same scale, logistics of millions or billions of people cannot be simulated. Climate cannot be accurately simulated for more than a fraction of a day in West Cork. Um, ecosystems cannot be simulated. Investment, data security is a huge problem uh, which cannot be dealt with by classical computing. And of course, national security is a massive problem. So enter the quantum computer, what we're here to talk about. This is proposed to be a revolutionary way forward in uh, data, in, in computing and in data management um, to deal with these and many other intractable problems for the future. Now, to understand how this thing works, often you're told, you know, switches can be one and zero in a classical computer and any number in between in a quantum computer. Well, I'm an experimental low temperature physicist. That's not how I think these things work. So I want to tell you how I think they work. So first of all, I have to remind you about quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is the basic theory which was developed to describe the internal structure of atoms. And then in the, that was in the 1920s, 30s and 40s in molecules and materials. And then by the time 60s and 70s came solid state physics. And finally, you know, by now, 100 years later, quantum mechanics is entering information technology. Um, it's based on the elementary idea that Schrodinger introduced that every object is actually not a point like particle. It's some kind of a wave, a propagating oscillating wave. And if everything is a wave, then it's possible to get interference between two waves, two identical particles. If they're in phase, then they add together. You get more of the same. That's not a surprise, but two identical particles, if they're out of phase and they add together, you get nothing. And that can't happen in the classical world, but it happens in the quantum world. Um, the other thing is um, energy. So in the classical world, an object can have any amount of energy. If you imagine something vibrating like a violin string or a swing swinging, it can have any amount of energy. But if you use Schrodinger's equation, um, an oscillator like this can only have energies which are quantized, a list of energy values which are allowed and no other energies. Um, now, in that case, how do you get from one state to another? That was always a mystery of, of quantum mechanics in the beginning. If you're in some quantum state, how do you make the jump to another state? Well, this is Isidore Rabi. He showed that um, if you deliver some oscillating um, field, let's say if these were electrons, this would be a laser. Um, and the frequency of this laser is set such that it equals the energy difference between the states divided by Planck's constant then you start to cycle between the two states. Essentially, if you take your Schrodinger cat picture, if the two states are dead and alive, well, you just cycle between dead and alive and dead and alive while this oscillator is on. That's called quantum oscillation. And finally, here's uh, John Stuart Bell, um, Ireland's arguably greatest physicist of the 20th century. So he showed if you have two systems, each in its own state, if they're not interacting, well, that's fine. They're in their own states. But if they start to interact, then the system starts to cycle between all possibilities. So the live cat dies and the dead cat comes to life and cycles around and around. 
So that's it for my review of quantum mechanics, but there are four ideas here which are critical to uh, the technology underpinning quantum computing. First of all, you can get quantum interference between states. Secondly, the states are quantized in a quantum system. Only a certain set of energy levels are allowed. Third, you can travel between them by using Rabi quantum oscillations. And fourth, if you have more than one system and they interact with each other, then they cycle between all possible possibilities. All four of these things are used in modern quantum computers. On the basis of these ideas, the technology for superconductive quantum qubits, which is the area I'm interested in, has been developed. So superconductors are macroscopic quantum states. They're uh, met metals, which are zero electrical resistance or infinite conductivity. This is a magnet, but it's sitting on top of a superconductor and it's held in position because the currents in the superconductor um, you know, continue to flow forever without any current supply to keep the magnet floating above the superconductor. Now, how can that happen? If you think of this piece of material as a box full of electrons, all the electrons, you know, if you're at room temperature, they're all in a variety of different states. Some are at high energies, some are at medium energies, some are at low energies. But if you cool down, eventually you'll reach a temperature where all of the electrons fall into a single macroscopic quantum state. So now all of the electrons in this brick of material are in one quantum mechanical state, even though it's big enough for you to see and touch. And it's on that basis you can make a quantum computer. Now there are many, many superconductors, thousands and thousands of them, and they range in, so there's a temperature that you have to fall below before they work. So that temperature ranges from near absolute zero all the way up to room temperature now. Um, and, you know, over the years, since the discovery in 1911, the working temperature of these materials has been growing steadily until in 2020, uh, uh, exactly one month ago, actually, Mikhail Eremetz reported in Nature the existence of a room temperature superconductor. Uh, this is widely accepted. If you want to bet on the Nobel Prize in physics, I can point you to a very good bet here. And the only thing which is surprising about this, or, or, may, or maybe makes it, you shouldn't rush out and invest in this immediately, is that the pressure of the material, which is superconducting at room temperature, is uh, many millions of atmospheres. So we still don't have an ambient pressure, ambient temperature superconductor, but we're searching assiduously for one. Now let's turn to a qubit. How would a qubit work? You take two pieces of superconductor. Here they're aluminium. Here's one and here's the other and you put an insulator between them. Okay, so maybe that looks like a diode to um, you know, a semiconductor person, but it's not because the two pieces of aluminium are each in their macroscopic quantum states. And the current which travels through this device, current I traveling through the device, is not controlled by the external voltage the way it is in a conventional device. It's controlled by the quantum mechanical phase, actually the difference between the two phases. Now, the current is controlled by the, qu the quantum phase, and actually so is the voltage. It's controlled by the rate of change of quantum phase. So this is a purely quantum mechanical device. We can figure out how much energy is stored in this device from its capacitance. That's a conventional capacitive energy stored. And how much quantum mechanical energy is stored from this quantum phase. It goes as one minus cosine the phase. And once we know those energies, we can write the Schrodinger equation for this device and solve to find its quantum states. These solutions, if you're a mathematical physicist, are the Matthew functions, and they're very, very well understood. But what this means is that you have a micron scale electronic device, but it's a purely, it's now a quantum mechanical device. It's ruled by quantum mechanics, not by classical mechanics. It's a quantized electronic device. And it's as if it's some kind of an atomic scale thing, but it's not at the atomic scale. It has billions of atoms in it. Because of the superconductivity, you can make a micron scale electronic device, which is quantized. Okay, so here's a picture of a real one, fabbed on a sapphire surface. Um, inside this device, there are quantized charge states. We can control this device now through three control uh, uh, electrodes. There are three couplings. Here's the device. There are three lines which control it. This one, this one, and that one. So the first line, number one, is used to control which state the system is in. 
by sending in a voltage oscillating in time, we can go from one state to the other. We can cycle between the two states. The second, elect the second connection is used to entangle two side-by-side -side devices. By opening and closing this switch, we can entangle two qubits. Um, and the third uh, lead here is used to determine what actually is the ultimate state of this device. By, read, by reading the um, uh, transmission of electromagnetic radiation on this line, we can tell is the cat alive or is the cat, cat dead in a simple deterministic measurement. So with, these three, with this arrangement and these three controls, it's possible to create a superconductive quantum computer. IBM pioneered them. Um, now they're commercially available. The IBM uh, Q1 is available, widely used. Um, but there are many other high-tech companies that are also rapidly following the route of developing superconductive quantum computers. Intel, uh, Microsoft, they use a different device. Uh, Rigetti, they use this a device approximately as I showed you. Uh, of course, uh, Google's famous uh, Sycamore quantum computer. All of these devices are now built and in operation and generating amazing new results, actually. Here's one from the end of last week from IBM's uh, 53 qubit quantum computer. They simulated a new state of matter, an excitonic condensate, which people like me have been waiting for for decades. So these devices work um, at the level of mainframe operation and they represent their existence represents the fact that the future of computing can indeed be revolutionarily different. Okay, so where does quantum matter come in? Um, well, I've been focusing on superconductive uh, quantum bits, superconductive qubits. And they're the elementary, um, they're the equivalent of the field effect transistor for semiconductor computing. But here they're superconductive qubits. And here's a IBM quantum computer. It's a pretty massive and expensive object. They provide a very nice schematic of how it works. A lot of the high frequency electronics is here and it could be miniaturized. But this this part is a giant refrigerator. This part is a giant refrigerator. And indeed, refrigeration is, is critically required for the devices as they are today. Here's room temperature at 300 Kelvin. Here's liquid helium at 4 Kelvin, deep space at 2 Kelvin. The operating temperature of many of these superconducting qubits is a few tens of millikelvin, 100 times colder than deep space. And they won't operate if we go up to a higher temperature. So, uh, and you know, how did we get to this point? Well, some of it is historical. The material which is used in these computers is aluminum and its critical temperature is one Kelvin, minus 272 degrees centigrade. Now there are many, many other computers in the world, but for historic, uh, sorry, superconductors in the world, but for historical reasons, aluminum is the one that's used. Now, um, you know, massive refrigerators are, are required for these devices. We could, diminish the scale of the devices and the expense and you know that we could enhance the commercialization if we could increase the operating temperature to a few Kelvin. And if we could increase to 100 Kelvin, we could make you know the refrigeration be um, a Cascade Peltier refrigerator, it just costs 100 euros. So there is a real opportunity for frontier physics here to get away from aluminum superconductive qubits. These are the superconductors we have available now above 100 Kelvin, copper-based, iron-based, and hydrogen-based. And the study of these materials is challenging and difficult for physicists. It's a fundamental question of quantum matter research. For the physicists on the line here, uh, we usually start with a quantum spin liquid, which is an insulator, but a macroscopic quantum state, dope it with carriers to produce some strange metal state, and eventually, if we can drive that metal state into a high temperature superconductor, we end up in this phase. So that's wonderful, but we don't really understand how these materials work. So new experimental technology has been developed to examine the physics of these exotic compounds at the atomic scale. And much of my work is involved in that. So this is the surface of a crystal of high temperature superconductor. And each dot there um, is a lithium atom. Each one of these guys is an impurity atom. And over here, we have an image of those quantum mechanical shredding or quantum mechanical waves. And they're actually different at every energy. So when I can run this movie and see the quantum mechanical waves in the material at every energy. 
This has proven to be an incredibly powerful new way of examining exotic materials and understanding how they work. And, um, you know, we're developing two of these machines now with sport of SFI in UCC in Cork. The labs are now built. We're be beginning to build the machines just at the moment. All right, so in examining these materials, uh, spending some time examining these iron-based and, uh, sorry, these copper-based and several iron-based materials, we've learned a tremendous amount. But actually, the key thing we learned about these copper-based materials is that they won't work for uh, high temperature quantum computing uh, because they have loads in the energy gap for the, tech, for the technical members of the audience. So we're pretty sure these guys won't work, but these guys might. This is iron selenide, a beautifully simple material. We can image and understand its electronic structure in minute detail in the superconducting phase. From that information, we conclude that this is a material simple, consistent with existing fab technology. It's a fully gapped S-wave superconductor, so it's consistent uh, with fab for uh, qubits. And we believe that it is a very good candidate material uh, to provide a route forward to higher temperature superconductive quantum computing. Okay, so I'm gonna wind up here. Everyone knows that, you know, to go from mainframe of uh, classical computers took us through many decades of work, but eventually we go from one of these complex, expensive mainframes to the wonderful technology we have today. So, you know, for people like me, the long-term question about quantum computing is not does it exist or can it work? We already know that it exists and it works. The long-term question is how can we get from this mainframe technology to compact, ambient temperature, commercializable, widespread usage uh, quantum computers? And with that, thanks very much. And I look forward to getting some questions later. Thank you. Thank you, Seamus. Uh, thorough introduction to the whole field and, uh, and to your effort in that area. So um, I'd like to go through ye and get the perspective sort of at the other end of the spectrum as it stands right now, which is applications from a major international corporation, which has always been at the forefront of computation and computing power, that is IBM. And, and where does IBM stand with what their activities are now, where do you see it going? And also, uh, given the forum we're in, what is the role of IBM in Ireland towards those efforts? So, Dr. Joe, please. Yeah, thank you very much. And I would say, and I'm super excited also, I'd like to thank Seamus for the wonderful introduction and a lot of IBM uh, technology was covered in there already. And also like to share with you my motivation uh, to, you know, form a material scientist and worked on low temperature superconductor, namely niobium, niobium titanium and niobium 310. I'm sure you see those on um, Seamus's slide. And my postdoc work is exactly on those high TC superconductors. So now I'm working for IBM and looking at how can we make commercial applications uh, of these uh, uh, of the superconducting material and quantum computing is truly exciting. And so, I mean, let's take a look at, I would say, you know, from ecosystem perspective and how ready uh, the, uh, you know, the world is, right? So I can share some of the IDC data and, and why it is important to, to get into the, um, the quantum advantage stage. So I was also personally be a little bit surprised by, um, you know, how many companies are actually anxious to get into it. So you look at 72% business said, they're very interested in quantum computing. That's pretty high. And now let's get into you know, more tangible uh, numbers. 52% are planning to experiment with quantum compute in the next 18 months. Then you have 22% people are already testing, evaluating and experimenting with a quantum computer service. 11% already operationalize a quantum use case. And IDC also predict by 2023, 25% of the, of the uh, Fortune 500 company will gain competitive advantage for quantum computing. That's truly exciting landscape. And then I also would say, if you take a look at globally, you know, how uh, company, I mean, how um, government and regional governments are preparing for that. 
And so in US, uh, let's take a look at example, right? So the president signed um, actually called a national quantum initiative into law back in, in December of 2018. Now in Europe, I think many of you already know the Europeans uh, quantum computer flagship initiative started also in, uh, in 2018. Now you have Japan, another very, you know, uh, another country very eager to, uh, to gain advantage in, in, in quantum computing. There was a Tokyo statement on quantum cooperation with the US that was signed in December, December 19, uh, 2019. And so these are examples of, you know, how different nations and the regions are, are, are getting to quantum computing and, and provide us uh, very strong support. From IBM perspective, we're looking globally. And so uh, um, we are looking many different areas. And if you take a look at it, right? Um, so in back in 2017, we launched the called IBM Q network. Uh, the idea is to build a, a global ecosystem. So as of today, we already have uh, 247,000 users globally, and they ran over 450 billion, there's not million, billion quantum circuits. And um, as of today, we have 29 quantum computers. Uh, the nice thing about that is you can also access these quantum computings without a cloud technology, through the cloud technology. And we also build um, more than 130 clients and partners and also um, collaborating in, on the 30 plus applications, many different application areas. And we also uh, released Quiskit, which is an open source quantum computing um, programming framework. And the, all together collaboration with scientists around the world. And we, there are over, 20, uh, over 400 scientific papers. So that is actually very exciting in terms of the uh, um, the landscape and also, you know, the ecosystem around the world in different areas. I also like to share in terms of the application areas uh, where we are, and I think some of those are very relevant to, you know, to Ireland because given um, a lot of those industries are right here in, in Ireland, you're talking about those very promising areas where we can take advantage of compu quantum computing. You have chemicals and petroleum is one area, distribution and the logistics in another area, and also financial services. Um, and uh, there are other areas also very promising when it is in healthcare and life science, and also as well as the uh, manufacturing. In terms of the local activities, what we are doing with, uh, you know, with, with the local uh, uh, ecosystem here. So um, very excited to share with, uh, with everyone that the, I think many of you already know that um, there was a large scale 11 million euro of quantum computing in Ireland initiative. Uh, the thanks to, you know, uh, to uh, um, SFI and other Irish government, they put in quite a bit of money, 7.3 million euros was, uh, was a DTIF fund. And so uh, in this particular uh, consortium, we call it. And so we are partnering with some leading companies, enterprises and the leading institutions and also startup. So in here we have MasterCard, and we have uh, three uh, leading institutions here with Tindo, UCD, and Maynooth, and also two uh, startup, Equal One and, and, and Rockley. And so uh, the, the objective is really to extend Quiskit, which is, uh, as I mentioned, is the open source quantum computing software developed uh, a development framework and funded by IBM. So we're gonna extend the Quiskit to support multiple um, cubic technology. So you're looking at a UCD and Equal One and they're pioneering position-based qubits and uh, Tindo and also um, Rockley, they are, they've been focused on the you know, photonics qubits and uh, Shemis also mentioned additional new, I'm sure new hardware and new, new devices will be coming up pretty quickly. And also if you look at Maynooth University and they've been working on the um, topological superconducting systems uh, for, for more than a decade. So we're very excited about the local ecosystem and IBM's global ecosystem and the overall, I mean, uh, ecosystem around the quantum computing. So, uh, so, so back to you, uh, Mike. Thank you very much for, you, for that perspective from IBM. And I think we'll be coming back on some of those points uh, once we follow up with the, the introductions. But with that, I'd like to take it over to Dr. Shoga and uh, the um, perspective from the Science Foundation Ireland as it represents 
the researchers in Ireland and uh, collaborations internationally, and also uh, the perspective of government funding. So, Kiran. Thank you, Mike. So um, I think you've, you've teed us up very, very nicely with Seamus setting things off in terms of the context of you know, quantum computing and quantum technologies and the sort of the investment there in the early stage of research. And then Rui has literally painted a very compelling picture of where it's going and that sort of industry investment and industry excitement about quantum. So then from, from an SFI perspective and uh, from an Irish government perspective, the question then we're tasked with is really to understand what we do about this and how we join the dots. And, and essentially that comes down to just two core questions. You know, where are we going as a nation in Ireland with quantum technology? And secondly, how do we get there? And we have started having these conversations to see how we make those connections and how we answer them. As Mark uh, did, said in his introduction there, we do have a set of core skills and a critical mass that has developed in quantum technologies in Ireland. We're still a small nation, a small country. So you know that's uh, both a disadvantage and for us it's an advantage. And we've focused on how we can use that sort of agility, that sort of small, um, small degrees of separation in Ireland and really make that advantage in sort of joining up how sort of researchers, policymakers, uh, and industry can make this thing happen as a country. So some of the things we've talked about, you know, we, it's easy enough in Ireland to get together all the sort of the, the core actors in quantum technologies. And we put them all into a room actually earlier this year to ask ourselves that question, you know, what does it mean for Ireland? Sort of a little bit of a SWOT analysis, you know, what have we got? What's, what's, what, what, what's in the country? And we are surprised or sometimes when we look at this, just how much strength we have uh, in the country in quantum technologies. We also have as a country, if you think about the, the companies that Rui alluded to there, we have a very ICT heavy uh, country and economy. We have a lot of pharmaceuticals in the country. There's a lot of interest. And every other day when we talk to industry players, you know, there's a sense of when you're doing something in quantum technologies, we want to be part of this. So that interest, that draw is there. But at the same time, you know, we're, we're a small country, small budget, so we have to box clever. And, um, you know, we, we are, well, we sort of see ourselves as a bit of a sister agency to the NSF. We don't have anywhere near the, the budgets of the NSF. So we have to ask ourselves the question, you know, so how do we you know, go along in this journey? What is the unique thing that Ireland brings <clears throat> to the quantum technology story? And that's something we're working on right now. So we start off, you know, we create a, a quantum advisory group that's nationally focused and, and represents all groups that way. And then what we do is we, we partner. And that's one of the things in Ireland that we focus on quite strongly. We're partnering in, in an EU level in Quantira. We also partner with the NSF on uh, you know, US Ireland programs and quantum technology is a core part of what comes through in that. But we're looking as well at the talent and the skills we develop. And part of our job in SFI is to make sure that the talent is, is in Ireland, you know, either the homegrown talent or where there are gaps you know, to attract in the talent that, you know, that we need. And we still see the two as uh, distinct things. You have talent and you have skills. And, and the talent are the people like the Seamus Davis and the people that we bring in who are going to you know, train the next element or the next cohort of people. And the skills are the individuals that are going to be required to drive that, that transition in industry that Rui just talked about. And it's coming quickly. Um, Part of our job is not just to think about what skills are needed in the next two, three, four years, but actually to start to understand what programs are going to be required in seven, eight, ten years' time. And that's where, you know, if you're going to do that kind of re investment, we need to be looking far around the corner to see you know, what programs do we need to establish right now? What setups do we need to put in place in the country in order that we can have the skills and the people that are coming out of our universities and out of our research performing organizations that will then feed into the industry demand that's coming as, uh, further along? and also fuel that future pipeline of new researchers and new technology that keeps coming out. So that's a circle that we're kind of conscious of. We also need to make sure that you know, our, our strategy as well in Ireland is to leverage what we call our distributed excellence. So um, while we might be a small country, what we have learned is that we have pockets of excellence in many locations around the country. And because we're small, we can pull those together in a way where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And by you know, connecting our partnerships, as well as working with our universities all across the country and using that sort of small scale, we can actually punch way above our weight, which is one of the things we're very keen to do. So as a, as a funding agency, it sits very much with SFI right now to figure out from a, a national perspective where Ireland is going um, and to figure out that journey of how we get there. And I think you know, with people like Seamus Davis on one side and people like Rui on the other side and others, I think we have a, a very compelling and, and interesting story to tell in Ireland. So I'll leave it there, Mike, go back to you because I know you're conscious to get into time, keen to get into some questions. We've only got a short amount of time left. <coughs> Thank you very much. Um, unmuted. Okay. All right. Thanks for the perspectives from each of the panelists there. Um, there's, there's many if issues I think we could get comment from all three of you on. Um, and, and a lot of it pertains to, at least some of it pertains to what Kieran just went over is the sort of the, the human capital is within the country of Ireland and the island of Ireland. 
the SFI and, and the universities obviously want to support uh, undergraduate, graduate students, called postgraduate students and postdocs and in to recruit new faculty to work in these areas. Uh, I'd like to, so I'd like to hear your opinions of where you stand now as a, as a nation, maybe as, as from the university perspective uh, for the, the recruitment of students to work on this. For example, Kiran, you got your PhD in quantum physics and, and Seamus, one of your positions now is professor of quantum physics. Um, in, in, in my world, uh, we may do quantum, but we don't, we typically don't have title of quantum in, in our roles. Uh, I think that's the way you're moving there is in a, in a good direction. It's very clear what your focus is. Quantum is an enormous and enduring field for many years to come. But what about the, the pipeline for the students? Uh, do you have to uh, re attract mathematicians and chemists and physicists and electrical engineers? Or are we looking for, in Seamus's viewpoint, are you just hiring physicists or, or bringing in as grad students? And, and Rui, what, what is IBM looking for in terms of workforce uh, five years from now, 10 years from now, or even starting now? And, and does Ireland have the education force and the workforce and, and are they on a on a determined path to get there. So um, maybe Seamus, do you want to jump in with respect to the, the, your, your view from academia in terms of the, the academic workforce for other faculty such as yourself and grad students and how, how national is it? How important is it to be like most of science is truly international and your own group? I see, obviously you have international students from China and you have position in Germany. I think that's the role of science for a long time. So how do you see uh, your university, your lab, and Ireland universities together uh, in, in, in terms of recruitment of students? So I, I think the pool of um, Irish, of people who attend Irish universities graduate with degrees in physics and engineering and data science and so on. It's superb. Uh, I haven't had any difficulty finding brilliant Irish uh, trained students to join my group. So I, I'm not too concerned about that. I mean, maintenance of the health of the universities, which is, you know, not the remit of Science Foundation Ireland. That's a different department. And that's something that we all need to be concerned about. But the talent pool is excellent, um, as I'm sure you know. Um, and also recruiting. Now I've been recruiting for about a year. We have recruited people direct from the Chinese National Academy in Beijing, people from Moscow, um, you know, people from all over the world. So um, I, I think Ireland's a very attractive place now for young scientists to begin their careers. Um, it looks like the opportunities are excellent. We would like to suppress the fluctuations so, so that these young people can anticipate funded PhDs, funded junior fellowships and funded professorships. And under those circumstances, I think we're definitely on the right direction. Very good. And uh, Rui, how about from your perspective in terms of who is IBM looking to hire in Ireland and do you see uh, an appropriate flux of, of uh, appropriate level, whether it's PhD or master's or bachelor's coming out of the Irish universities for workforce? Yeah, that's a great question. And so, you know, when we look at a compute, I mean, quantum computing, right, we don't just look at devices. It's basically a whole stack you're talking about from systems and simulators to circuit optimizer, libraries, algorithm applications, all the way to tools on top. And so the skills we need are not only you know, I mean, uh, from Ireland perspective, because our team really focused on the, a lot of work is on optimization. We have a group of mathematicians and also with very AI, very strong AI background. So I would say we'll require uh, skills, you know, from quantum physics all the way to people working on optimization and, uh, and also software engineers need to develop applications in, in other areas. So that's, you know, from IBM perspective, of course, we are talking about an island, IBM, we have um, uh, many different labs and different locations working on different things. And if they're looking for, say, working other locations that require other skills. But I also like to point out in terms of, you know, uh, the education for quantum, where it should start, are we gonna only focus on uh, graduate schools or colleges or what about, you know, K through 12? Because um, if you look at the US, um, the key, they call it Q2 work 
That's a National Science Foundation funded initiative led by University of Illinois and U Chicago. They basically provide a quantum education program and tools from K through 12, believe or not. And so that K through 12, right? And so IBM, on the other hand, we are partnering with the coding school. We offer online a free quantum computing classes for high school students and above. So high school students, it could be undergraduate or could be graduate students. And we offer up to 5,000 students. And so already started October last month and it's, go it's a win year. It's gonna finish uh, May of next year. So I think, uh, I mean, from, you know, the, the near term um, skills requirement and also we need to look at longer term. Shall we also looking into beyond just college? What about high school or even, even lower uh, you know, I mean, even even younger uh, uh, students. So that's that's my my comment in terms of the near term and longer term. Thank you, Ruby. It's very exciting this new program you have there. Kieran, do you have some comments on that from the SFI perspective? Then, yeah, I suppose. I mean, it's it's, it's really great to hear from people like Seamus that you know that you can get top talent, and it's something we've always believed in that Ireland has you know a hotbed of really top talent. But um, I suppose we're not satisfied with that being you know, enough. You know, we always want to go further, push harder. And so what it is, a lot of good top talent there. We want to make sure that we push our programs that we have for PhDs even further. And um, you know, we want to you know, grow the homegrown talent, attract in the other talent. But when a PhD or postgrad is working in Ireland, we want to make sure that they become the most sought after PhDs in the world when they finish with their, their, their grad programs with us. So you know, we're working on a sort of a frameworks of PhD programs that will be uh, cohort driven that are really about focusing on getting people ready for whatever they're going to do next, getting them industry ready. So we do, you know, we're looking at you know, doing cohort based PhD programs, getting industry involved in those, making sure that the academics are sharing them across different um, universities and really making sure that those PhDs get, you know, come out very much ready to hit the ground running. So um, I suppose it's a combination for us of, you know, that recognizing the talent, getting really good programs there, growing the homegrown talent, attracting in more and making sure that as we look further around the corners and further down the road, that we're always sort of filling the pipeline with, the, with talent because at the end of the day, we know, you know, talent and skills, that's the key to everything. Very good. Thank you. It's very exciting to see uh, the, the ecosystem built from all three perspectives here and it's growing. I think an important thing to think about, um, and you've all touched on it in various ways, is sort of the scaling of this. I mean, uh, if you're going to build a fab to make these things not on 50, you know, 1, 10 or 50 qubit, but uh, large scale, we have to either build new fabs or tweak fabs that are built for conventional semiconductor systems. And, and in parallel with that is, uh, and it was brought up also by uh, a, a, a viewer here, is the projected cost curve against the economics of scale. So this scale of the fab to scale the whole technology. Um, and, and of course that harks back to um, some of the comments that in Seamus's presentation about low temperature versus, versus more amenable, higher temperature. And so IBM must be thinking of this all the time is how do we scale this? And a lot of it might be depend on the material science and the fundamental physics of the likes of Seamus labs. But uh, how do you see the timeline for that, uh, Dr. Zhou, and including with respect to the, eco the economics of scale? Yeah, I don't know if I can comment on the economic scale of that because I'm not really involved in the costing and, and, and those information. But in terms of the, uh, you know, the scalability uh, from the technology perspective, uh, we just published our quantum roadmap, I think it was two months ago in September. And so if you take a look at it back in 2019, we released the 27 qubits and uh, 2020 by the end of the year, we're targeting to look at the 65 uh, qubits. And our commitment is by 2023, we'll have um, over 1000 a, a qubit. So that's a roadmap we have. And so, uh, you know, just give you perspective that of course that also requires the scalability of the dilution refrigerator because that's very important as the system getting bigger. Uh, there are not commercially available dilu ref uh, dilution refrigerators. And so we need to design and build our own in, in, uh, in order to uh, uh, cope with the, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the roadmap that we, we put in place. So that's a comment I, I, you know, I like to make, but I don't really have the, you know, the cost information. And uh, another scalability I like to comment on is, uh, unlike the low temperature superconductor that I worked on, you know, quarter century ago when I, uh, on my uh, PhD work, 
uh, where you need to basically install the device. Uh, doesn't really matter it's MRI or the nuclear magnetic resonance, um, um, you know, the analyzer. And for quantum computing, now we developed the technology. People can access IBM 29 systems by a web. So as long as you have internet access, you can actually get on uh, a, a quantum services. You can use IBM's quantum computing. So that also uh, removes the barrier for some of the uh, scalability uh, uh, constraints. All right, thank you. And I guess, um, Seamus, you had did you did touch on you're now moving towards the um, the higher temperature and selenide superconductors. Uh, it's it's uh, maybe not appropriate to say you know when's it going to be ready, but we heard this in the early days of superconductivity. When are we going to float our trains on high TC and the like? And we're not there yet. And so 30 years later. Uh, so I'm not asking for a timeline, but I'm just asking for, um, aside from major breakthroughs of which maybe last month there was the beginnings of one with these high room temperature, if they can mimic what it took to do that under ultra high pressure at lower or ambient pressure, the world will change rapidly. But absent that type of breakthrough, uh, what sort of time scale do you see transferring the likes of what you're developing out of the lab into startup companies or whatnot to start building quantum computers? Um, to answer that question, we'd need to get more attention from the great um, millikelvin based uh, quantum computing companies of the world because they're focused on the technology that they chose 20 years ago uh, to reach, to do the miraculous work that they've done to reach the present point. It's often very difficult to say, um, you know, I love your fantastic aluminium based quantum computer, but I think you should get rid of it and replace it with a iron selenide based computer, which will work at a hundred times higher temperature. That's a big shock for strategic planners. But you know, for people like you and me, it's our job to think that far ahead. And um, I suppose we need the scientific and engineering ecosystem to become a little bit more mature so that it's possible to address those issues now rather than waiting 10 or 20 years before they appear to be ripe. Yeah. Okay. And uh, as to the timeline, iron selenide superconducts above 100 Kelvin now. So the time Kelvin is now. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Now, Kieran, you have a different, uh, maybe a broader perspective in that the SFI probably funds um, academics working on aluminum or aluminum, as you say, uh, junction superconductors, but also it was mentioned there's photonics and there's ion. And so what do you see in the pipeline out there for the types of um, academic labs that are developing for other than superconducting qubits? Yeah, that, that is a, it's a great question actually. And it came up in the discussions when we had um, a number of our colleagues together in the room there that I talked about last January, because as it happens, we, we have, you know, research professors sort of with, with labs and cohorts focused on probably three of the main competing areas between superconducting ion and um, photonics. And um, there was a lot of discussion in there. And interestingly, you know, everybody sort of is looking to see the direction of travel, where it's going to go, which is going to land first. Many of them are being pursued in parallel. I think it's probably a bit too early to call which is going to land where. There's a lot of focus on the photonics space at the moment. It has a lot of advantages to it. Um, you know, there's, we have some very, very strong photonics capabilities. You know, quantum entanglement in the photonic space is something that's been there for you know quite some time. Probably, arguably, that is the starting point of, of of much of the entanglement. If you think back to the early experiments of, of where it came from, so I would say it's probably too early to call exactly where it's going. We have at least you know we have three of those covered in some of the core and the main research labs in Ireland. Uh, we were pursuing all three in parallel, but also keeping them connected and talking and sharing the knowledge and the information, so that we sort of see what we can learn from each. It's an interesting uh, one to watch over the next couple of years. Yes, thank you. It just occurred to me, it, uh, I guess prior to last week, I would say it's been like waiting for the, uh, the uh, cure for the virus coming out there. We have all these different companies trying different technologies and whoever gets there first may not be the, the long-term winner, but at least we have uh, we have two to look at right now, or at least in the US there's several in other, every other country. I'd like to go back to the international aspect a little bit. I, we heard good prospects for international collaboration in terms of attracting students and postdocs and faculty and the like, but um, I'd like to hear maybe first from Kiran for SFI's position on 
sort of funding collaborations between say the EU or SFI in US or SFI and um, connections to Asian or, you know, Australia or whatnot? Are, are, there, are there activities going on now that either are happening but not in quantum or uh, not at all that it could be in quantum to, to sort of leverage the best that Ireland has to offer in collaboration with people outside? Because as I mentioned earlier, and as most of us know that science is international as it is to begin with, and the question is, what do the funding agencies, what activities and prospects do the funding agencies have with respect to international collaboration? So Kiran, if you're still here, looks like he may have dropped off. Anybody else want to comment on that? <laughs> Ruyi or Seamus? Yeah, I can comment on in terms of the, um, you know, collaboration, right? And so it, it's, a, it's a very good question. And so I have to think about it because I have to think about it within IBM, outside of IBM. Within IBM, there's no boundary because we have just the research labs itself, right? We have 19 different locations. Forget about the IBM as a whole, as a corporation, we have 170 countries. So to me, there was no boundary when I work with Tokyo or work with US and, you know, work with other um, other um, Zurich and, or, or UK, there was no boundaries. And so we always collaborate. But locally, when we work with the, uh, for example, this consortium we talked about in, in Ireland, right? And so they're not just working with our small team here in Ireland. They're really, we are the uh, interface into the much larger and broader global IBM research. And so I think the collaboration comes in different ways. And so, I mean, you can leverage certainly some multinational like IBM and to access um, the, the resources and skills in, in, in other parts of the world. So that's how I, you know, I, I hope that the, uh, the value IBM can bring to, to Ireland in terms of collaboration, reach global, uh, global reach, we can play as the, uh, the interface and, and the help connect with different parts of the, um, um, you know, of, of the IBM in outside of Ireland. Thank you. Kiran, I'm not sure if you, uh, you temporarily dropped off. I'm not sure you heard the question or... No, I didn't. Sorry, I, I lost the connection there for a bit. The question was to, to, to uh, jump back temporarily or briefly to the international aspect and to see uh, what does SFI have cooking or going on now or planned with respect to um, collaborating, say, with SFI, I'm sorry, NSF or the Chinese Science Foundation or other um, other countries to leverage uh, Irish capabilities in Ireland with international collaboration in terms of, you know, joint fellowships, joint postdocs, and, and even in that respect, a uh, question came in, does SFI plan to support independent postdocs for early career fellowships? Well, so the first part is with respect to international collaboration uh, okay. from SFI standpoint. Right, lots to cover there. So I suppose firstly, I mean, a lot of our researchers do uh, collaborative research anyway. So when we fund yeah. research, we, actually, we support that, we look for that in, in, in general. It's something that is sort of seen when we do international peer review as a, as a good thing. So we look for that in general terms. Um, with the NSF, we do have a program that we run at the moment, the US Ireland program. So there it's sort of a collaboration where you have researchers from the Republic of Ireland, the North of Ireland and the US. Um, and that's a, it's a program we love doing. We're, we're very keen to work and continue working with we have a great partnership with the NSF. Um, and um, the way that works is that, you know, the researchers come in with their research topics. And as long as the three jurisdictions are recognized, it's then managed through the NSF processes where the NSF operate as a lead agency. So that program is continuing. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's one we are very, very keen to continue. And it has great collaborations, great partnerships. In fact, it's the core of the program. You, you literally can't be part of that program without the collaborations. We have other collaborations and other programs that exist. Uh, I think I kind of saw relationships there, you know, um, cohort-based training programs with the UK. So the, you know, the, we call them centers for doctoral training. So we are doing some of those in collaboration with the UK as well. And um, if I to get to that last question, the independent and the early careers, that's something that's very much top of mind for us at the moment. I'd say for that one, I'd, I put a watch this space um, notice on it, but it's, it's definitely something we're aware of and uh, actively working on. Thank you very much. So I think the timing is such, I, think, I recommend the, the audience out there that want to hear more about that, uh, the international collaborations, look at the SFI website. You're also welcome to look at IBM's, IBM Ireland's website and Dr. Davis's website at Cork or at Cornell or at Oxford. 
And with that, we're just about five seconds over. So I'd like to thank all three panelists. I'd like to thank the um, SFI and Embassy of Ireland again for, uh, I think, a reasonably successful uh, um, webinar here on physics, the physics, the comp computing, and the enterprise aspects of the future of quantum. So thank you all for participating and thank you all for watching. <laughs>